When I was a child growing up on a farm in the wide open American Midwest, I would go outside on a clear dark night, look up in the sky, and I could see thousands of stars. It was easy to imagine we are not alone in the universe. And it was the start of what turned into my career as a scientist searching for life beyond Earth. Reminiscing about that childhood sense of wonder is kind of heartwarming, but I was not exactly scientifically sophisticated about the whole thing. <laughs> See, I grew up in the 1960s, and so my idea of making contact with alien life was much more influenced by the science fiction that I saw on television than by science fact. So one thing that I learned uh, from Star Trek, for example, was that if you want to meet some aliens, just hop on the Starship Enterprise, and every week you could meet a, a new civilization on a new planet, and they always spoke English. <laughs> yeah? Very convenient, very convenient. Um, now, whatever you can say about the challenges facing the crew of the Enterprise, uh, are they going to get attacked by Klingons? Are there dilithium crystals going to blow up and destroy the entire Federation? Well, whatever the challenges they faced, they had one clear advantage over us. They knew that the universe is just chock full of life. We don't know that. And we need to face that fact head on. Today, I'll tell you about three distinct ways that we could discover life beyond Earth. And we don't just have to rely on a, a childlike sense of hope that they're out there. But in fact, we can draw on our experiences from our adult lives, living in a world of ambiguity in the midst of relationships that never come with guarantees. You see, science will open the door for us to new possibilities, realities beyond anything that we could imagine. And our experiences from our daily lives can provide some guidance for scientists in how to make commitments and take action in the face of the unknown. At its best, science will embrace uncertainty as it boldly seeks to understand our place in the universe. Now, before we start looking at the specific ways that we could find life beyond Earth, let's start by getting oriented to where we're located in space. We're all familiar with this image of the Earth floating in space orbited by the moon. Well, the Earth is one of several planets close to our sun. Uh, the other planets in the inner solar system are Mars and Mercury and Venus. As we move a bit away from our sun into the outer solar system, we find Uranus and Neptune, Jupiter and Saturn. And then our sun is only one of many stars in our region of the universe. In fact, it's one of over 100 billion stars that are located in the galaxy we call the Milky Way. Now, all of these facts were known when I was a child. There's nothing new here. But what we didn't know at the time is whether any of those stars have planets around them like our sun has planets around it. But all that changed 30 years ago with the discovery of the first exoplanet, a planet orbiting another star. And since then, there has been a proliferation of discoveries, but it has been possible only because there were a handful of astronomers who were willing to take the risk to search for something that may not be there. Thanks to them, now when we go out and look at the night sky, we know that virtually all of those stars are orbited by planets. So we know that there is a lot of real estate out there that could be inhabited, but we still don't know whether life really exists out there. Well, to look for life beyond Earth, there are three ways we can do it. 
And the likelihood that we will succeed with each method depends on two factors. How many places we can look, the more the better, and how long will it take to complete the search? The sooner the better. And the most likely way for us to discover life beyond Earth in the near future is through SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. With SETI, astronomers look for radio signals being sent from advanced civilizations around other stars, intentional signals. Think of it as a, a cosmic lighthouse that's continually sending the message, we are here, we are here, we are here. And SETI has two great advantages for finding life in the near future. First of all, because it's been going on for over 60 years, we are right now in the middle of a search for over a million stars. We're searching over a million stars in our galaxy and then a hundred other galaxies as well. And even though the stars are quite distant and it takes a while for the signals to get here, because we're in the middle of the search, we could succeed as soon as tonight. So mo the most likely way to detect life beyond Earth in the short term is through SETI. But what happens if there are no intelligent civilizations out there? Or if they're so few and far between, it's going to take a long time to find them? Well, we expect microbial life, similar to bacteria here on Earth, to be much more widespread in space. Now, the downside is bacteria can't create radio transmitters, so they can't let us know that they are here through technology. But that's okay because it's enough to detect bacteria for them simply to exist. All life forms give off chemical signs that they are here. Plants give off oxygen, animals give off carbon dioxide, microorganisms give off their own characteristic chemical signature. And we can detect those chemicals in the atmospheres of exoplanets. And we can be optimistic about being able to find microbial life on other planets if it's really out there in the not too distant future. In 2029, the European Space Agency will send a mission into space that will look at over a thousand stars and the exoplanets around them to see if there are signs of life. And so we will know within the next 20 years or not whether there is abundant life in the universe simply by looking at the atmospheres. And the great advantage is we don't have to have evolution go through all of the twists and turns that are necessary, all of the chance events to lead to intelligence. And beyond that, to an intelligence as required by SETI that can send radio signals and an intelligence that has the motivation to send those signals. To detect bacteria, we don't need motivated bacteria. All they have to do is exist. But wouldn't it be nice to find life a little bit closer to home? Well, the good news there is about 10 moons and a planet in our solar system that could be the abode of life. It could be life that has existed in the past. So at an earlier stage of its evolution, Mars had liquid water flowing on its surface. And so perhaps just under the surface of the red planet, there are microfossils, evidence of life from Mars' distant past. Or it could be life that still thrives within our solar system. So if we go to Saturn in the outer solar system, one of its moons, Enceladus, is encrusted with ice and underneath that ice is a flowing ocean that could be full of the nutrients that would let life flourish even now. The big disadvantage, though, of searching for life in our solar system is that there are only a handful of places where we could find it. So unless life arises in almost every place that it is a potentially habitable world, we're not likely to find it in our solar system. At the end of the day, we humans cannot control 
whether or not there's life in the universe. It's either there or it's not. However, we have a tremendous capacity to decide to find it if it's really out there. And that's true whether our search is for radio signals from advanced civilizations, whether it's looking at the atmospheres of distant exoplanets, or whether it's searching right here within our solar system. In all three of those cases, to move ahead with the search, we need to do the hard work, make the commitment, and be willing to deal with the unknown. And at first, that sounds like a pretty steep order for science. To ask scientists to spend their careers looking for something that may simply not exist. And yet, if we stop and think about it a moment, those are the kind of choices we make in our daily lives all the time. A little over 20 years ago, I met this interesting person. <laughs> uh, we had a number of shared interests. Her online profile uh, said that she likes theater and a good cup of coffee. Okay, I could work with that. Um, turns out she was very intelligent, very attractive, funny, and she was very contented living an independent life with a career that she enjoyed with many friends, and actually so was I. But what would happen if instead we decided to live our lives together? And not just for a few weeks or a few months or a few years, but for the rest of our lives. Well, I'll never know exactly what would have happened had we gone our separate ways. Because since we met, we have time and time again moved from one city to another, one home to another. We have married. We have stayed married. And we have embarked on this joint project of our life together. Now, looking back, it's easy to say, well, this must have been fated or it was inevitable that it would turn out like this. Believe me, that, that's not at all the case. Now, some things have stayed constant. Other things have changed. Uh, one of the constants has been our love for theater. So the first time we came to London many years ago, we saw The Lion King. Um, now we go every year to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Other things have changed, though, a bit. For example, coffee. A couple of years ago, Julie decided she wasn't going to be drinking coffee anymore. Instead, she'd drink tea. So she's gone from a nice French roast to Earl Grey. <laughs> now, presumably, uh, all of you understand uh, the, the benefits of tea over coffee. Oh, you don't. You don't? <laughs> I have someone I want you to meet during the break, okay? <laughs> There's always hope. You can never know. But seriously, uh, you may have gotten the idea, correctly, I would say, that I'm a guy who spends a lot of his time with his head in the stars. And I understand fully that that is not always the easiest thing for a woman who is trying to live her life here on Earth. <laughs> Thank you. And through it all, we have stayed together. So why do we think that science should be any easier than the rest of our lives? The early exoplanet hunters understood this. They were willing to take the gamble to look for something that may not even exist. And because they did, 
we now know not only that exoplanets are out there, but they're out there everywhere. And we are at a place in our search for life beyond Earth where we're posed with the same decision. To be human is to live with uncertainty. If we demand guarantees that we can discover life beyond Earth before we actually reach out and search for it, then we're guaranteed to fail. But if we are willing to put in the hard work to embark on a search, not knowing whether we will succeed or not, then we are guaranteed to find at least one civilization that has the passion and the dedication to understand its place in the universe. And that civilization is us. Uncertainty and all. Thank you.